Dialog commenced operation in 1984 via an office in Taman Mayang, Petaling Jaya. Crude or refined petroleum is transported via pipelines, oil tankers, trucks, or even rails. Over the past 10 years, their net profit rose from 118 million in 2010 to 576 million for the trailing 12 months ending December 2020. That still gives a compounding annual growth rate of 17.2%. Today, they are part of the FBM KLCI with a market capitalization of 18.2 billion as of February 2021. Hi everyone and welcome back to our channel, the best place for long-term stock investors. My name is John and in this video, you're going to learn about Dialog Group Berhad aka Dialog, stock code 7277. We will be covering its history and management, its business model, what is their latest financial status, as well as the potential risk and reward before you decide to invest. When we pump petrol into our cars or apply lipstick, we usually take for granted the effort and resources it takes to bring the product to the consumer. This is where Dialog comes in, as it provides a range of services that helps bring petroleum resources to the market. Let's start with its history and management. Dialog commenced operation in 1984 via an office in Taman Mayang, Petaling Jaya. They secured their first major EPCC or Engineering, Procurement, Construction and Commissioning contract to build a rubber dipping facility in Sri Lanka, of all places. In 1996, they were listed on the second board of KLSC with a market capitalization of 55 million ringgit. By 1997, their foray into storage facilities began with the built, own, and operation of a 600 million centralized tankage facility in Kerte, Trunganu. They were transferred to the main board of the KLSC on the 21st of March 2000. In 2006, they started establishing their presence in the international markets both in Australia and the Middle East. They began building owning and operating their 700 million ringgit Tanjong Langsat tank terminal facilities in 2007. Their biggest project thus far, the Pengerang Deepwater Terminals or PDT, began development in 2009. PDT's official opening in 2014 was the same year Dialog relocated to their very own building, Dialog Tower in Petaling Jaya. What a momentous year for them. Today, they are part of the FBM KLCI with a market capitalization of 18.2 billion as of February 2021. Let's now look at the leadership team at Dialog. We have Tan Sri Ngao Bun Kiet, who is the co-founder, major shareholder, and the current executive chairman of Dialog Group. He started his career with Mobile Singapore as a refinery engineer, then moved to Petronas, where he left as the engineering manager before starting Dialog in 1984. Next is Executive Deputy Chairman, Mr. Chan Yu Kai. He joined Dialog in 1993 as General Manager from his prior stints at Petronas and ICI. He was also the President and Chief Operating Officer of Dialog before his current position. Che Zainab Binti Mohamad Saleh is the current Group Chief Financial Officer. She joined Dialog in 1995 as an accountant after she left PricewaterhouseCoopers with auditing and financial management experience. Their current Chief Operating Officer, Inchek Mustafa Kamal bin Abu Bakar, was appointed to his position in October 2014 after joining in 2001. He was with Petronas Charigali Sanyam Bahad and other oil and gas related companies prior to joining Dialog. By the way, all these guys I've mentioned here have been around since the early mid-90s, with the exception of Inchek Mustafa in 2001, which still means they have all served Dialog for more than 20 years. By the way, have you gotten a copy of our Stock Portfolio Guidebook? This guidebook shows you how to start constructing your six-figure portfolio and how the rich invest across various different asset classes. Best part is free and you can find the link in the comment section below. So what is Dialog's business model? They are the leading technical service provider in the oil and gas and petrochemical sectors for the region. Their business is broken down into three major segments, which are upstream assets and services, midstream assets and services, and integrated technical services. 
For those of you who are not too familiar with the oil and gas industry, there are three segments which are broadly categorized into upstream, midstream, and downstream. In the upstream segment, companies are involved in the exploration and production of oil and natural gas. This is where companies will locate, extract, and produce crude oil anywhere around the world. They could be in the middle of the desert or in the middle of the ocean. You know, they began drilling in the Arctic. The facilities built to extract the oil will have to withstand harsh environmental conditions and tolerate huge uncertainties. Therefore, the upstream segment is usually the most capital intensive of the oil and gas industry. It is not like you can peer through a transparent window to see exactly where the oil and gas is underneath the ground. In the midstream segment, crude or refined petroleum is transported via pipelines, oil tankers, trucks, or even rails. This is where the products are also stored temporarily before being shipped to the downstream players in the industry. Finally, the downstream segment is where crude petroleum is refined into usable products like petrol, gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, lubricants, and a plethora of different petrochemicals. These refined products are then distributed to the end customer, sometimes via the same midstream companies that transported the crude petroleum to the refinery in the first place. So Dialog is involved in all three oil and gas segments, but not refinery as part of their business strategy. This is to hedge the natural cyclical nature of the business. And I will describe this at the end of the video. So do remember to watch till the end. Under the upstream segment of Dialog's business, they have participating interests in production sharing contracts or PSC, offshore Sarawak for three fields, namely D35, D21, and J4. And no, they are not durian variants, okay? Dialog also has an oil field service contract on the Bayan field of Shosrawa via its indirect owned subsidiary Halliburton Bayan Petroleum Sinrama Hart or HBP. In the upstream business, PSC operators are usually compensated from the difference in between the market price of the crude oil versus the cost of production with certain percentages paid to the government or national oil company as a royalty. In their midstream business, they own operate and store terminals that handle a variety of crude oil, petroleum, liquefied natural gas or LNG, as well as other petrochemical products. Their terminal assets are mainly located in Kerte, Trunganu and Tanjong Langsat. Dialog calls them Dialog Terminal Langsats or DTL. And last but not least, Pengerang Deepwater Terminals or PDT in Johor. Dialog also owns a supply base in Jubail, Saudi Arabia, which serves as a one-stop logistic hub and resource center for the oil field services, equipment, and supplies. For their midstream business, they are paid a fee by their client to store either crude or refined products in specially built tanks for different, different types of products. These contracts are normally long-term in nature that stretch anywhere from five to 10 years. Some of these storage contracts are spot, meaning whatever extra capacity they have will be rented out at spot rates. For the integrated services business, it consists of different technical services. The first is the Engineering Procurement, Construction and Commissioning or EPCC for oil, gas and petrochemical projects. An EPCC contractor like Dialog will design, plan, procure the equipment, construct and commission the entire facility for the client before an operational handover. The second technical service they offer is plant maintenance and catalyst handling services, including major plant turnaround services. The third is the supply and service of specialist products and services. The fourth is their fabrication services of machinery and process equipment. And lastly is their digital technology and solutions businesses. Very, very wide. For all these services, Dialog are remunerated based on either a one-off contract like EPCC or through a master service agreement for their plant turnarounds. As you can see, Dialog has quite a wide range of services within the oil and gas industry. Most investors usually associate Dialog with the Pengerang story, which has been one of their largest capital investments to date. But we must also not overlook their other business segments as well while not as recurring, but do provide a hitch against the cyclical nature of the industry. 
Our objective for starting this channel has always been to upskill investors and create a like-minded community so we are able to invest with our money better. We do this by creating concise but well-researched content. If you have benefited from watching this, do help us smash that like button so that this content can benefit a wider audience. And if you're new to our channel, remember to subscribe, hit that notification bell so that you know the next videos are out. What about Dialogs Financials? Well, I don't think most businesses were spared from the COVID-19 pandemic and Dialog was no different. The trailing 12 months revenue ending December 2020 was 1.7 billion, a 26% drop from 2.3 billion in June 2020, which is their financial year end. Their net profit also dropped from 648 million to 589 million. In their latest quarterly report, they attributed this drop to their focus on the development of Dialog's own internal midstream terminal assets, namely Dialog Langsat Terminals or DTL and Pengerang Deepwater Terminals or PDT. Therefore, they didn't manage to secure external EPCC contracts that were more one-off in nature but could bring an increase in revenue over the short term. One thing to note though, over the past 10 years, their net profit rose from 118 million in 2010 to 576 million for the trailing 12 months ending December 2020. That still gives a compounding annual growth rate of 17.2% over the past 10 years. The other thing to know, while revenue remains flat, their increase in net profits have come from the profits of their associates, which they have been diligently building over the past 10 years. Their operating cash flow remains positive at 446 million within the same period. What about their liabilities? The total liabilities come up to about 2.8 billion, with a big portion coming from their long term debt of 1.7 billion. Cash and short term investments come up to about 1.2 billion, or roughly half of their total liabilities obligation. The oil and gas industry does require huge capital outlays, and it's just the nature of the business. Most oil and gas companies go into bigger debts just to run their business, and I feel Dialog is in a much better position compared to its peers. Next, what are Dialog's business risk? I would broadly categorize Dialog's business risk into two, namely operational and strategic risk. One operational risk is the hazardous nature of the industry itself. The dangers of a major safety incident are all too real. Take the case of Shell Bukom Refinery in September 2011, which took days to extinguish and shut down the entire plant. Add that to the economic consequences of repairs to get the terminal up and running again. The second operational risk would be the execution of large-scale construction projects to be on time and on schedule as well as within budget. This will impact the revenue streams of projects for the group and may even incur penalties by their leasing clients if there's a delay in the schedule because if the projects are not up, then the tanks cannot be stored and therefore they don't collect fees. From a strategic risk perspective, a key risk would be the energy transition that the world is going through right now. The world demands for cleaner energy and there is a lot of pressure on the reduction of carbon footprint. This will reduce the demand of oil and gas going forward. Last but not least, another strategic risk would be increase in competition and overcapacity. In particular, the storage and petrochemical capacity building in China. Based on a report from S&P Global, China will expand its crude storage capacity by 15.11 million meter cube by the end of 2020. Is there any growth catalyst for dialogue then? Back to the point on operational risks. Risks in the oil and gas industry cannot be eliminated completely. It is just managed. Based on Dialog's track record of building and operating their Kerte, DTL and PDT plants, they have proven that safety is a priority for them too. The only way they can manage risk going forward is the continuous installation of good safety culture in their workforce as well as their contractors. With regards to their large-scale project execution risk, they have proven their execution ability well. This is shown by their cumulative billion ringgit project execution, both for their internal and external clients, especially for their tank farms. From a strategic risk perspective, the location of Pengerang is so geographically blessed, both for Malaysia 
and dialogue specifically. Now, why is that? Every year when there's summer season, what happens to our neighboring countries of Philippines, Vietnam, Hong Kong, and even China? They get hit by typhoons. Malaysia? We're not in the path of typhoons, and neither are we on the Pacific Ring of Fire that is the fault line for earthquakes in this region. Next, are we blessed to be located along the Straits of Malacca? What's the correlation? This is the route between the biggest producers of the Middle East, Russia, Africa, to the biggest consumers of oil in Asia, which is China, Japan, and Korea. So you see, it's geographical positioning again. The last, and I feel the most important growth catalyst will be this. Let's say China will eventually build enough storage capacity for themselves. And we discount that demand growth for China negligible for dialogue. We then look at the peer comparison to what the area of Pengarang can actually be in the future. Rotterdam Port, the largest refinery and petrochemical center of the world, and it has a 28 million meter cubed storage capacity. It is to serve the European population, which has a size of 400 million people. Currently, between Malaysia and Singapore, there's about 14 million meter cube of storage to serve the Southeast Asian population, which has 660 million people. These 660 million people will have an ever-increasing demand for petroleum products, which leads to ever-increasing storage capacity during transit before its process. You guys get the gist. I hope you have been introduced to the breadth of Dialogue's business and provide you clues on how to do your own due diligence before deciding to invest. Thanks for staying till the end of the video and do watch some of our other videos on this channel. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram with the links below and I'll see you in the next video.